So if you've shot any amount of video on a proper camera, you know, like that one there, you've probably not liked shooting with just the little screen that's on there. That's where camera monitors come in. They have a lot of features and tools that make things a lot easier. We're gonna talk about that and some of the downsides to using them. So as you can see here, I'm actually using the Atomos Ninja 5, which is a five inch on camera monitor. It's meant to be on the camera. It kind of is right now, I've got it on a magic arm. And probably the most obvious benefit to a monitor like this on the camera is that it's just a bigger screen than the built-in screen on you know, the FX30 right here. And I feel like I shouldn't have to explain why a bigger screen is better but there's a lot of benefits. One, you can see focus better. If you're doing manual focus, you can just see what's in your frame better. Like maybe that, maybe I didn't want to have that in my frame. Maybe I wouldn't have seen it on the little screen, but I can see it on the big one. There's just very clear benefits to a bigger screen. And on-camera monitors usually will come in five inch and seven inch versions. I currently only have a five inch, but I would like at some point to get a seven inch, maybe something like a small HD, Indie 7 or something like that, but that's like $2,000. The next really big benefit to camera monitors is the brightness. Now, if you've ever shot outside with, you know, just the LCD screen on your camera, if you're in bright sunlight, even at the brightest setting, you know, you can adjust the settings on Sony cameras, for example, and I imagine you can on other cameras as well. You can adjust the brightness of the screen. So if you are outside, you can turn it up, but sometimes that's just not quite bright enough and most external monitors will be brighter than most on camera screen. And the majority of decent quality monitors would be anywhere between a thousand nits and maybe up to like 1800, 2000. They are getting a lot more expensive the brighter you go, but you know, that sort of minimum of a thousand nits can be very helpful when you're shooting outside. And this next one very much depends on the level and the size of monitor that you get, but they can often be much higher resolution than the built-in screen on your camera. A lot of five inch and even seven inch monitors are only 1080p, but because they are relatively small compared to like a computer monitor, the pixel density is still pretty good. Although some seven inch monitors can be 4K, so they're gonna be even sharper. And there's one thing that I've noticed with the marketing of external monitors, a lot of the time they'll stay 4K, but they just mean it can take a 4K signal doesn't actually mean the screen itself is 4K. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Make sure you look at the actual display resolution if you are wanting a higher resolution display. The next benefit we have is it's easier to reposition and put wherever you want to put it compared to the screen on your camera. If you look here, I've actually got this monitor on a magic arm so I can put it sort of wherever I want. And even if I was holding the camera and operating shooting something else, I could easily just move the magic arm and put the monitor exactly where I wanted it. Or like how I'm doing this video, I could turn it around and have it face me and I can sort of put it wherever I want. And I'm gonna get to the actual like monitoring features in a second, but the other two sort of benefits that some monitors will have as features are wireless transmission. Now this is pretty rare for a monitor to have it built in. Often you'll have to get another piece of hardware to do the actual wireless transmission. Some do have built-in transmission like the Polyland M1. They are both a transmitter and receiver, so you can have one monitor on your camera and another monitor somewhere else, and it'll wirelessly transmit the signal from your camera to that other monitor. Or you could link it with a wireless receiver and then plug another monitor into that. And then of course, with this sort of thing, there's also different levels with price and technology. For example, like a Teradec is what they would use on big budget set. And then you have that Mars M1, which is like, you know, a pair of monitors is like a thousand bucks, 1500 bucks, something like that. And then somewhere in the middle, you'll have like the DJI transmission system. But wireless transmission can be very helpful when you're either shooting yourself and you're a long way away from your camera, you can't see the screen rather than running a really long cable. Or if you have clients or directors or someone that needs to see the image while you're operating the camera. So you can have a wireless signal go to your director's monitor and then you can have people crowding around that rather than trying to peer over your shoulder to look at the screen. And then the other feature that monitors like this one, the Animus Ninja 5 have, is external recording. So there's actually an SSD in the back of this. And this SSD in particular is from AngelBird. It's like in collaboration with Atomos. And 
This is a 500 gig one. You can get obviously multiple terabytes if you need, and you can record through the monitor up to whatever resolution and frame rate that particular monitor can do. Like this one can, I think, do up to 4K 60, whereas, you know, you get the Ninja Ultra or the Ninja Plus or the new Ninja, maybe, and other ones, of course, they can do like 6K or 8K or stuff like that. And it means you can use SSDs rather than SD cards or CF Express cards. And these are often much faster. These are definitely faster than any SD card. And they can also be in much higher capacities. And per gigabyte, they're also way cheaper. But one of the other benefits of external recording is you can shoot in format that maybe your camera doesn't support. For example, internal compressed RAW. Now, the company Red has a patent on internal compressed RAW video, so no other company can make a camera that has internal compressed RAW recording unless they pay Red for it. So none of the companies do that really. So what they do instead is they allow the RAW output through an HDMI cable or SDI cable, depending on the camera, into an Atomos recorder, for example, where you can then record ProRes RAW. I'm not gonna say anything about ProRes because I don't really know that much about it, but the Atomos Ninja 5 can do ProRes RAW, so if I did wanna do RAW recording, I could, but I don't because I have no need for it right now. There's also a bunch of other formats that you can use that maybe would work better with editing software or less powerful computers or stuff like that. So there is a bit more flexibility there. Okay, so now on to kind of the most useful part of having a monitor, aside from just being able to see the image better, is all the monitoring features that most monitors will have. And most of them will help you either expose better or focus better. Now, on the Atomos here, if you just tap the screen, you have this little UI here. And then in the yellow menu, if we, if we have nothing open, you can just see we've got like, you know, the time running it. If I had the SSD in there as well, I could also record. But if I open the yellow menu here, this is all the sort of monitoring tools. Basically, we have a few for focus and a few for exposure. So there's basically two main tools to help with focusing. First one you can see here now, right now, because of the way that I'm running it through the camera, I can't use this one-to-one, -one, but that'll just punch in at one-to-one -one resolution, I'm pretty sure. But next to it, we just have the two times, which will just zoom in two times. So if you're doing manual focus, you could have a much more zoomed in image to you know, get that critical focus. And then the other focus feature, which is built into most cameras is peaking, which if I click that now where it's focused, you'll see there is that pink sort of you know, outline over edges and stuff. So that just sort of tells me what's in focus. And I have found that the peaking on the Atomos Ninja 5 and the, you know, Sony cameras that I have do work slightly differently. And actually I think I prefer it on the Ninja, especially being pink, you can change the color, but like I found pink seems to be the most obvious. Uh, and then you can also set the different levels. You can have it really subtle, you can have it really strong. Having it set too strong can sort of mean too much is being, affected by it but so those are the main focusing things then you have a bunch for exposure so really quickly you just have a few like sort of graphs basically which first one here you'll have your waveforms which which basically just shows you the level of all the exposure in the image if i move left to right you can see the brightness moves left to right because it's showing you where you know the brightness is and then it's telling you the brightness level on the y-axis and then you have the rgb waveform as well which will do a very similar thing, but it just separates into the red, green, and blue channel. Next one here, you have your vector scope, which will just show you sort of where the colors are in the image. And as you can see, because it's, this entire image is very similar color, so it's all just gonna be sort of one spot. But if I had a vast array of colors in the scene, like if I change my color on here, you can see that's moving around on the vector scope. Okay, and then the next two we have are the zebras, and then the, probably the most important, the pulse color. Zebras work just like the zebras in the camera. I talked about zebras a lot in my recent video about S-Log3, so if you are interested in exposing S-Log3, made a whole video about that. Basically, you just set your level as a percentage, and if there's anything that is at that brightness or above, then the zebras will show up. So if I go in to change my zebra threshold down to like, 65, you can see the brightest parts of my skin here are lighting up in the zebras. Usually I have it set to 95, and honestly I don't actually turn it on that much because I use zebras in the camera or I'll just use false color, but it is a useful tool if you wanna have just zebras on there. And now of course, one that maybe a lot of people don't understand, 
but is very useful and professionals use it all the time. It's used for exposing in basically any sort of professional way where you're gonna use false color. Now this looks really weird on the screen as you can see, but it makes a lot of sense once you understand it. So this scale right here is telling you the exposure level that each color is. So anything that's let's say between 55 and 58 percent IRE, then that's gonna be in that sort of pinkish color, which you can see here on the outline of the line and then also some on my face. And this can be a really good way to see the range of exposures you have in your scene to make sure you're not flipping your highlights or crushing your shadows and just getting the dynamic range of the scene itself within the dynamic range of your camera's sensor. So on this camera, basically we don't want anything orange or red and we don't want anything in those like darker blue or purple. Generally green on most false color systems will be around that sort of 40s area, which is sort of that ideal in tone exposure. And as you can see, I've actually overexposed slightly. I've got the gray that's above the, the green and pink. So most of my skin is actually in the like 59 to 77 range, which for S-Log3 work because S-Log3 just prefers to be overexposed, but that's false color. I hope it makes sense. Let me know any questions if you are unsure. Going through the features even more, I didn't mention it before, but there are also a lot of like framing type tools. Sort of the most obvious one is gonna be the rule of thirds. So if you wanted to use the rule of thirds for any sort of composition stuff, you can. And then you also have stuff like frame guides, which right now I have set up for nine by 16. So if I wanted to shoot this both for YouTube and also get some vertical clips out of it, if I set this up and I can make sure that I'm in that in that frame, then I know my vertical clips are gonna be fine as well. And you can set that frame guide to a bunch of different ratios. You can set custom ratios. So if you were shooting in, you know, 2.4 to one or four by three or something like that, or like I said, nine by 16, you want to frame for that, but shoot wider, basically. You can use a monitor to do that. A lot of cameras also have some features like that, but they're a little bit more limited. You've also got your safe zones where you can just sort of leave an outline that, you know, maybe you want to just keep everything within that. And there's sort of different variations of that. And then you have your anamorphic de-squeeze. Now this is going to look really weird when I click this, but basically if I had a two times anamorphic lens, this would look normal because this is basically stretching the image out by two times horizontally because that is the opposite of what an anamorphic does. Now this is 1.8, 1.5, 1.33. 1.33 .33 works really well with 16 by nine and then we're back to normal with no de-squeeze. So if you were shooting on anamorphic and if your camera doesn't have a de-squeeze feature in it or maybe you want to look at, you know, the squeeze version on the camera screen and then the de-squeeze version on the monitor, most monitors will have an anamorphic de-squeeze feature as well. And then you can also just have like color stuff like if you want to go monochrome, you can do that as well for whatever reason. And some monitors will have a few extras like this one also has like onion skin, stuff like that. Not something I use, but could be useful if you want to use something like that. Monitors like this, you can usually also load LUTs into because some cameras you can't load LUTs into. But basically if you have a LUT of an example grade or if you just want to you know change it to rack 709 but let's now go on to the downsides of using monitors as i mentioned before you can you know put it wherever you want depending on how you're mounting it with a magic arm or just with a little monitor mount but it does mean that if you want a really small rig that rig is going to be bigger because you have a monitor on it so there's probably a fair few scenarios where you wouldn't necessarily want a monitor on there because maybe it's drawing attention from too many people or it's just you want a really light setup and that's just adding too much weight and when it comes to weight monitors especially bigger ones can be pretty heavy especially when you add on batteries if you have a battery on the back of your monitor directly and you're not powering it via a VMA battery that monitor itself can be very heavy depending on the size of the battery you get like I've got a NPF 970 on there so this is actually very heavy for you know, the size that it is. So it can sort of make it a bit of a challenge when it comes to balancing a rig, because having a rig balanced can make things a lot easier, even if it is pretty heavy. I actually figured out a new way to rig my FX30 and I made a quick short about it. So go check that out if you're interested. Basically, I just mount it on the back in place of a V-mount battery, because I don't have a V-mount battery. And when it comes to V-mount batteries, if you have a monitor, it's another thing that you have to power. So you either need a battery on the monitor itself, a lot of, Monitors actually have two battery slots, so you can hot swap them, which is nice, but 
again, another thing to power more weight, more size. But even if you do have a V-mount battery, for example, that's another cable that has to come out of, you know, your distribution plate or the battery itself to power the monitor. And then you'll also need more cables, obviously. And that's on top of the HDMI cable that'll go from the monitor to camera or SDI, depending on what camera you have. But that's the downsides. And as you can tell, there's not as many as there are benefits to using monitors. So unless you need a really small light rig, I would recommend using one if you have one or getting one if you don't, because they are very helpful. But now we're just gonna go over some other things that you could do if either you don't have a monitor or if you are shooting in a situation like this where I actually have my computer right behind me. So I actually have one of my computer monitors plugged into the HDMI out on the Atomos Ninja 5 so I can have my monitor right here that I can do stuff on. But then when I just wanna see a clean image of what I'm shooting, I can just have it on that other screen there. So that can be very helpful. It can work similar to how I was talking about director's monitors before. If you're in a smaller space, for example, and you can just run a cable to another monitor, and you can do this with any monitor with an HDMI input. More professional monitors would have like SDI and stuff like that. But you know, if you have computer monitors or TVs, you can just plug either your camera straight into those or run an HDMI from the HDMI out. On the, on the monitor that you do have and then into a bigger one. And I have noticed that it can be very helpful when you're looking at a bigger version of the shot. Because like I said, with the size of monitors, it can help when you're looking at your composition or what's in the frame and if you're doing manual focus. And quite useful actually when you're shooting talking headshots like this of yourself. And finally, it's just my sort of workflow when it comes to using a monitor. What I like to do is leave the camera itself in the log footage, I'm shooting an S-Log3. I don't like to use the LUT on the camera, either the built-in one or even importing my own one. I like to have the log footage just on the camera screen itself. And then I'll use zebras or histograms to help with exposing. And then on my monitor, I'll usually I'll run it in HLG because I found with like importing LUTs that it can do some weird stuff with exposure. Like it just doesn't seem to work as well. So I found HLG just makes the most sense that's hybrid log gamma. I'm pretty sure that it's meant to just sort of make any log footage look relatively normal. I think, don't quote me on that. I think that's what it's meant to do. But I've found it just seems to, it shows the most, it doesn't crush any shadows and it, it just makes a more normal looking image than log image. But you don't have to worry about the issues with exposure if you were going to run it in S709 or Rec709. For example, if I change to Rec709, you can see because I am overexposed, you know, all of this is just way too bright and I don't want to be looking at that. I want to be looking at what it'll actually look like. And if I put a LUT, for example, that I've made, this is actually very similar to how I would grade most of my videos but it doesn't look the same on the monitor. So I tend to not use the LUT on here because this does have the color adjustments that I've done, the color space transform to get from log to Rec. 7 and 9, and then also some exposure changes using curves. But yeah, like I said, I just prefer to use it in HLG because it just leaves a very clean looking image. And then I know roughly what it'll look like and I can do all the grading and stuff in post obviously. And if I need to get more specific about exposure than I can do with the histogram or zebras on the camera, then I'll just use false color, maybe waveforms on the monitor itself. And false color isn't usually a thing that you would like leave on all the time. It's more something you check to be like, okay, yeah, nothing's too dark, nothing's too bright. Everything's in good ratios. Okay, cool. And then we'll turn it off for monitoring. Okay. And right now I just experienced one of the very big benefits of having a monitor when this camera behind me, I can't actually see that. But if I had a monitor and run an HDMI cable to right in front of me, I'd be able to monitor both of them and I'd be fine because that one went out of focus and was actually tracking the wrong thing for some reason, even though I clicked on the screen here to track focus, but whatever. But that's another very good use case for external monitors like this. If you're either too far away from the camera or it's not in a spot where you can easily just look at it, for example, behind you or an overhead rig or something like that. It's very useful to be able to see what you're shooting. So that'll be all for this one. Hopefully you learned something about external monitors. Go watch my exposing S3 video that I talked about before. Do all the other things 
and I'll see you next time. Okay, bye. Hopefully the audio is fine because this room is super reverby.